Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. My name is Kartik, one of the co-founders of ETH Global, and I'm super excited to welcome all of you to HackFS 2023. This is the fourth time we're running this event, and it's so incredible to kind of see the fourth iteration here after four years of doing this. And I want to thank everybody who's watching this and tuning in on ETHglobal.tv. This is what we'll be using for all of today, which means you get to interact uh, with all of us and our, our teams and speakers to uh, kind of ask them any questions or any follow-ups and for us to also address any questions that you have. <clears throat> so let's get started. So this hackathon is brought to you by ETH Global in partnership with Protocol Labs. And our goal at ETH Global is to onboard thousands of developers into the Web3 ecosystem. <clears throat> and we do this primarily by running hackathons and summits. And these are both online and in person. HackFest is one of our online events. Uh, for this event, we also did an online summit that talked about all the things that are happening in the protocol network, uh, protocol labs network, uh, everything from how they're thinking about consensus to compute to storage and all the things that you can look forward to in the next coming months to years. And that took place on Friday, June, tw uh, June the 2nd. All the videos of the talks and panels are up now for you to watch and catch up on. You can, you can head over to the ETH Global YouTube channel to see all those amazing speakers. But the next hour and a half is about the hackathon. This was an amazing and massive event for us. We had 800, almost 840 hackers from 76 different countries participate, and they came in from 23 different time zones. Uh, we kind of put a, a map of where people were coming in from, from all the cities, and it's still amazing to see constant representation from six different continents. So welcome to all of you, and thank you for tuning in for some of you uh, super late at night and super early uh, for a lot of you. <clears throat> On top of just the hackers, we also had 29 ecosystem partners and 12 mentors who were there to help you succeed with your projects um, and also giving a lot of help and advice. And they were also giving in $150,000 in prizes. So today we'll also cover who won what prizes. Uh, so stay tuned uh, till the end of this to learn about who the winners are. I also want to quickly thank all of those amazing partners who made sure the last three weeks were incredible for all 840 of you. Um, and without further ado, I want to thank, uh, give a big shout out to Filecoin, ApeCoin, LibP2P, Backlyout, Ceramic, Lighthouse, Tableland, Polybase, LivePeer, Huddle01, Barracks, Push Protocol, ENS, NFT.Storage, Spheron, Lit Protocol, DRAN, Dataverse OS, Vision, Mona, and Chainsafe. IPFS, Filecoin Data Tools, Consensus Lab, Saturn, Secure Finance, Graph Paper Capital, Outlier Ventures, and Filecoin Foundations. Most of them are giving amazing prizes, so we'll be learning about who won what prizes and, and what they built. So let's go back to why we are here in this finale call. 838 hackers spent the last three weeks working on incredible projects, and Together, they made 200 projects that came out of this event. 200 projects were submitted this past Sunday, just three days ago, and we spent the last three days going through all the projects, going through judging, looking at every single one of them, getting feedback from judges, doing live calls with the teams to get feedback and get any questions clarified and get any answers for anything that uh, went into building those amazing projects. And through that whole judging process, we are here with nine finalist teams. So I wanna congratulate first those teams. And what today's gonna to be about is we're gonna bring these nine teams on and they're gonna show a live demo of what they built and what their project does and how they built it and why. So I wanna quickly congratulate these nine teams. We have Wallet OTP, HeartSight Hangouts, Decentral AI, Chitty Chat, Cosmic Waves, Subprober, Daggle, DeFi Kicks, and Web3 Stash. These are our nine teams that are going to come on one by one and demo what they built today for all of you to look. And after that, we'll kind of, we're going to cover all the prizes and everything else that we want to talk about before we wrap up HackFS 2023. So before we go into the very first demo, I want to take a quick second to thank 191 teams listed here for all the amazing work that they've done. Just because you were not one of these nine finalists does not mean there was something wrong with your project or you were not good enough. The goal for the finalists is for us to highlight some projects that our judges and the rest of the ecosystem is excited about as upcoming themes or just super creative ideas. A lot of you here are going to be winning and have won a lot of prizes, which you'll be learning about very soon. And we want to make sure that 
you also use this as an opportunity to learn and get more feedback on your project. This is by no means a way for you to be discouraged. We really want you to succeed. We really want you to be working on your projects after this event ends today. And we wanna be there to help you get any help you need, whether it's being connected to any of our partners or getting more feedback from a, a judge right after this event's ended or any other person that's within our network or the Protocol Labs network that you would like to be in touch with to take your project to the next stage. We wanna be there and wanna help you make that happen. So please, uh, do take the time to ping us and get any feedback in or ask us for anything that we can do for you. And we really hope that a lot of you get to continue working on the projects after this event ends. So with that, let's jump right in to our very first demo for today. And that is Project Wallet OTP. So without further ado, I'd like to bring on our first team and Steph, welcome, and uh, looking forward to seeing what you built. Awesome. Thanks, Kartik. Hey, HackFS. I'm Steph Orpilia, and I'm a Web3 dev who likes building products that are useful. Today, I'm presenting Wallet OTP, which is a decentralized wallet encrypted two-factor authentication app that provides one-time passwords for all of your services across Web2 and Web3. First of all, let's start with a little bit of context. What's 2FA? That stands for two-factor authentication, and it's the idea that you want to have two ways to log in. So the first way is usually your password, and then the second way can be an OTP or a one-time password sent to one of your devices. And that makes it harder for hackers to hack in or get access to your account, making it more secure. Current OTP solutions include Twilio's Authy app, Google Authenticator, and Duo by Cisco. There are other apps that exist and can hold those 2FA secret keys that log you into accounts, but I noticed some problems, uh, mainly centralization. So these apps have centralized storage and also centralized encryption mechanisms. So those lead to a variety of issues. First of all, data avail availability issues if um, the storage goes down, and also you don't have data sovereignty because some other app is doing the decryption of your secrets. And then worst of all, there's a UX issue with this. Um, these apps limit you to just one device at a time. So if you lose your phone or uh, you can't log in for any reason, you lose access to all of your social accounts, which is the worst. So these are two memes I made. Basically, I think that OTPs or authenticator apps should first of all um, have better UX, so you should be able to access them from any device. And I also wanted to get rid of the centralization problem so that you own the encryption mechanism. Um, so this is really for anyone who cares about data sovereignty and also security and uses a ton of devices like I do. So this is 2FA reimagined with decentralized storage encryption and OTP generation on any device. I'll walk you through the demo, demo in a moment, but this is kind of like the tech behind it. Basically, you can open the app on any device, even your phone. Uh, you sign in with Wallet Connect and then Lit Protocol decrypts all of your secrets that have been stored in Polybase. And then you can encrypt more secrets if you want to, or you can just read your one-time passwords that are generated every 30 seconds. So this is kind of what the UI looks like. But next, we'll get straight into the demo. If you want to check it out yourself, feel free to scan this QR code. But I'm going to walk through a demo where I actually add um, a authenticator app. So I'm going to add 2FA to my real email Google account. So let me add an authenticator. And the authenticator app will be Wallet OTP, which is my app. So I'm just signing in with my password. And I'll set up an authenticator. So I need to set this up by scanning a QR code. And I'll do that from my phone. So you can see my phone on the right side. I'm just opening MetaMask. MetaMask actually has a browser and my app is within the browser. It's also a website, uh, but this is Wallet OTP. This is what the DAP looks like. I'm just gonna sign in with my wallet. So connecting with MetaMask. Come on, Wi-Fi. <laughs> Okay, here we are. You see I already added a Be Real 2FA secret. Um, you can see the actual secret if you click in, or you can see all of the encrypted data. But I'm actually going to add another 2FA secret. You can either scan this code or enter it manually, but I'm going to scan. It asks to use my camera. So that was just all auto-generated from that scan. 
it grabbed the service, which is Google, the account, which is my email, and the 2FA secret from the service. So I'm just going to encrypt and save this data. Lit is doing the encryption behind the scenes. Oh, did I? I don't know if I uh, actually pushed that button. User error. OK, encrypting and saving. And here we go. OK, it's asking me to sign the message to encrypt and save this data. You can see what's been encrypted. And it's super fast, which is awesome. Um, you can see I already have that OTP on the side. So I actually need to validate that this is working. So I've already scanned. I'm just going to hit next. And I'll enter the code. Uh, we just got a new code, 340550 from the service. Verifying that. And my authenticator app has been set up. Just to show that this actually works, I'm going to open a new private browser. And I'm going to sign into my account um, in a way that will make me prove my 2FA factor. So I'll go to the Google account. This was my account. I need to enter my password. And then the last thing I need to do is send myself a code from the Authenticator app. So it's asking for my new code. Let me just open the app one more time. And we'll get my new code. 956022. Seven. And there we go. I'm into my account. So um, Wallet OTP successfully got me back in. So just to give a bit of a recap of that demo, I'm storing three different factors, service, account, and secret in decentralized storage. And it's encrypted ahead of time by lit. And then once it's stored in Polybase, the database is public, but all of the information has already been encrypted. So the only person who can decrypt it is the person whose account it is, in this case mine. And I used Wallet OTP to actually get that one-time password. The way I'm doing that is with a TOTP or time-based OTP algorithm. Basically, it's hashing um, my secret, which was added in that modal, and then also um, hashing that with the current time so that every 30 seconds that password changes. That's OTP, Wallet OTP. I would love to hear what you think. Um, scan this QR code and tweet me some feedback. Thank you so much. I had so much fun hacking at Hackafest. Thanks to the judges and the ETH Global team. Thank you so much, Steph. This was awesome. And thanks for going uh, first to be our, our first amazing demo. Uh, this is really cool. Hopefully, all of us get to, uh, to use it soon. And uh, Good luck in making this even better. Thanks, Kartik. All right, take care. So that was our first of nine. I uh, wanna get ready for our next teams. And what I wanna do next is bring on speaker number two. And that is Ding Chao from Decentral AI. This is Ding Chao. Hi, can you hear me, Patek? Yes, we can. Of course, awesome. So uh, let's introduce our fantastic team of Decentralized. Our talent team is scattered across the United States and Asia. Ethan still heading full stack and blockchain dev. Crazy UI UX, Joe Frontend, Peggy Backend, and I focus on product and machine learning. Our mission with Decentralized is to harness the power of decentralization to address present challenges in the AI industry. According to MIT, by 2026, we're going to run out of high quality language data. Berkeley researchers emphasize the need for human engagement to improve AI models. But the way big firms make billions of dollars scoop out our data without asking and without sharing a penny is discouraging us all from contributing. AI makes people's contribution, but we are left out and not getting fair share. This vicious cycle hurts AI's potential. Decentralized is the answer. It uses Web3 to allow community ownership of AI applications through DAOs, where data sets and AI apps are built together and governed collectively. Decentralized not only offers stable data solutions to businesses, but also ensures that all the financial gains are shared with the community encouraging their valuable contributions. And the best part, no coding needed. Now, let's dive into the demo. You can 
visit decentralized.us and log in using your wallet. Then you should be able to explore all the DAOs and apps being created by all the, by all the members. And then let's also create a new DAO for Filecoin Virtual Machine Copilot to empower Filecoin Virtual Machine education through collaboration and AI. And the DAO creation can involve token creation so that we can define all the reward distribution to members upfront. After reviewing all the details, then you can click deploy to make sure that, that your reward is guaranteed by smart contract. And then so that we make sure that people can collaborate trustlessly using blockchain technology. Once your DAO has been created, now people can join your DAO by taking on various roles, such as data contributor, add your own data, uh, data wizard, uh, process and clean the data, storage provider, instructor, server host, etc. Once you click join, then uh, we will mint an NMT to recognize your membership. See, this is where like, we can involve people from different backgrounds with different skills to contribute and, and work together. And next, let's add the data sets. This is where really the crowdsourcing shines. See this like where we can allow people to contribute knowledge just like Wikipedia style. And with Decentralized, people can upload data from Web2 or Web3 storage providers such as IPFS and Ceramic. Let's just add an FM tutorial. Uh, and then the tutorial will, will be encrypted using lead protocol by signing the transaction so that we can provide an extra layer of security and permission so that only controlled wallet can access your uploaded data. And then we will trigger a, a buckle job to pre-process the data, put them into different chunks, and then uh, convert them into word embeddings so that it can be pre-processed and consumed by AI models. Once your embedding is done, you will receive a notification from push saying that the job is done. Now you can check your document. And then next, we can create an AI app. So we've integrated with um, Diffy, a fantastic open source uh, large language model ops dashboard to allow anyone to manage their uh, AI bots. And here, people can configure prompts, variables, contacts, all without coding. Now let's just add the FM tutorial to the chatbot so the chatbot can have the FM knowledge to help any users. Then we just click publish, and now your bot is live on Sephiron. And then let's test it out. To, to chat, you simply just connect to your wallet. And then now let's add uh, the chatbot uh, FM question. How to send a uh, data deal to data DAO in FWM? A very specific question and then you see like our lead protocol will check my wallet has the right access to your ai bot and then in a few seconds we see that response has been generated by chat gpt with the knowledge has been crowdsourced by decentralized and it is quite powerful but it doesn't just stop there you can also um uh check how to create an api key so that other people can also build on top of your AI API. And the API key creation is also securely created and authorized to read the protocol. So only the people with the right access to generate the API key to share with other people. And it doesn't stop from there because once your model is deployed, it is very critical to ensure that you have continuous evaluation and combining to ensure the model is able to high quality and efficient. So that's why we present by this team. can enter uh, their uh, demonstration example. And we are working uh, to incorporate a zero knowledge proof library to make sure that the ranking and the voting is done anonymously using ZKP. And let's recap our underlying magic. So decentralized is built on top of a uh, five framework machine. Data can be moved in and out securely using XFS to move uh, with this of storage and parameters. That allow manages data processing, which is integrated with the cache to uh, make sure that we can build SVM horizon. And we build on top of tools such as Lenchen, Toma, Easy, for 
low-code AI creation models are deployed on Citadel, and the important learning from human feedback will be enabled to build on the quick code. With data and model access granted by this protocol, businesses can purchase the access with sales going back to the DAO directly. Decentralize, build AI together. Please check out our website at decentralize.us. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much for, for that awesome demo. And uh, it's good to hear that uh, you kind of were able to add all these features to this project and really make it super powerful. So hopefully you also get to continue working on this. And uh, thanks again. Thank you, Paddy. All right. Take care. All right. On to our third demo for today. I want to bring on Team Cosmic Waves to show you what amazing project that they built together. So welcome, everybody, and feel free to get started. Hello. Thank you. So I'm here to present you Cosmic Waves. But first of all, who are we? Well, we are a team that works together here in Portugal. I'm a product manager. Philippa unfortunately, unfortunately couldn't make it, but she did everything that you'll see uh, here look awesome. And then we have uh, our developers, David, João, and Pedro, that built and made all of, all of Soundwaves uh, possible. So we worked together, as I said, and we faced a problem, as in we wanted to experience music together uh, remotely but we couldn't find a solution that would simulate the experience of doing it in a room or and listening to the music at the same time. Either everyone was listening to the, to the song out of sync, or there were a lot of blocked APIs. And even if you are a content creator, there's the question of uploading your, your, your content to, to a storage or to a, to a server that you don't own. So that is the problem that we had. And then we built a solution, which is Cosmic Waves, a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer free broadcasting station that allows content creators to share their music and their songs to anyone, anywhere in the world. So a little bit about the architecture. Basically, uh, Leap to peer co coordinates the storage and stores the files in IPFS, while Polybase is storing the metadata uh, of those files. But this is all happening in the background. What does actually happen for, for the user? So as a streamer, I would go to the Cosmic Waves website, connect my wallet, because anonymity is important. So now that my streamer wallet is connected, I can access the stream webpage after verification. And on this webpage, I can see the playlist, playlist I already created and I can add new song files to it. For example, the office theme or even um, uh, our own opening theme. These files are being uploaded to IPFS. As you can see, I have to sign these, these requests. And once the files are uploaded, I'll be able to add them to, to my playlist, as you can see. So once the files are on the play playlist, me, as a streamer, the only thing that I have to do is to start my, my stream. And once I do, uh, what, I what I have, the songs I have on this amazing playlist will start being streamed uh, uh, on Cosmic Waves. So I'll start the stream. I'll do, I do have to, to stop the screen sharing so you'll be able to, to hear the audio. So just give me a second. Cool. Now you are seeing Cosmic Waves as anyone in the world. You're not a streamer, you just heard of Cosmic Waves. You just heard that a popular content creator is there showing their music. So you just, you'll just have to go to the website, no sign-in required, and just tune in. And once you are tuned in, you are broadcast and you can start listening to music. At the, at the same time as everyone else in the world is listening, so this is the problem that we had. Uh, this is a solution that, that we brought uh, to allow everyone to enjoy this magnificent, magnificent piece of art together and to simulate the experience of actually chilling around and listening to music. So this is Cosmic Waves and thank you for listening. Well, that was uh, such an incredible, amazing demo. It's uh, really good to see a, a decentralized radio player. It's, it's, I'm surprised that we haven't uh, seen this happen yet. And uh, finally, we kind of have a way to make this work everywhere. 
This is incredible. Yeah. Well, worth the wait, I would say. Congratulations, and uh, hopefully all of us get to uh, watch a, a live stream here very soon. All right. Cheers. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. So next up is our demo number four, and that is Project Daggle. So without further ado, I'd like to bring on our next team, Leo, to talk about Daggle. Welcome. Feel free to get started, Leo. Okay. Hey, guys. Uh, so I'm Leo from Team Daggle, and uh, this is my submission for the Hackathon 2023 Hackathon. And like before starting with the demo, let me explain you guys what uh, really Daggle is and what it does and the technologies behind Daggle. So Daggle is basically a platform to offload your extensive workloads to Backlog. Backlog is an open decentralized network of nodes which take in Docker images and uh, WebAssembly codes and it executes it for you. So like this is this can be a cost effective alternative to AWS Lambda and Google Collab. So yeah, this is like this is an overview of what uh, really Daggle does. Now let's get into demo. So uh, like first, let's go to the marketplace. In the marketplace, like we have something called as actions. So basically, these are actions. Uh, what really action is that? Uh, it's like pre-built Docker images and quotes which we have written it for you guys. So with just a matter of clicks, you can upload your actions to Backlog. And for this demo, like I'll be showing you guys two actions, which is a remove background and no J script. First, like let me go with a remove background. So what a remove background basically does is that it will take an image as an input. Like for this demo, like I'll be taking this image where you can find a family with a good background. And like let me remove this background for you guys. Let's open that image and let's submit this image to the backlog to remove the background. Yeah, uh, let's wait for it. So yeah, uh, it is done. And like before seeing the result for that, let me also submit a Node.js script. Here you can find a sample script, uh, but you can replace it with your own script instead. So here, let me change hello world from hello world to uh, hello from hackfs final, something like that. Yeah. So let me create that job for you. So yeah, let's wait for it to submit. So yeah, uh, it is done. So you can see all those jobs here, a script node.js and the remove pg. Like these two are the jobs which I submitted now. Before checking the results, like I would like you to, uh, like I would love to show you guys around my platform about the features which we offer. We have something called as data sets and models. Here, uh, like you can use these data sets to create the models, uh, like using an action which we have, which is called as train model action. In the background, it uses TensorFlow as an uh, code. Uh, like you have to paste your uh, Python code here, and you can even mention the data set which you want to use here. So if you don't have a data set here, like you can upload it from this tab. So yeah, uh, once you have selected your data set, you can click on train model. Once the model is trained and everything is done, you can find all of your models here. So yeah, and we also have something called as credits. So like if you need to run an action uh, platform, you obviously need credits. To buy those credits, we like you have to pay. Like we have five credits for five file coins. So like this is just a demo. Like later we might be changing that. And we have also enabled notifications for you guys. Like it uses push in the background, push notifications. So whenever there is a status update, uh, all those notifications will be pushed to you and like you have to uh, subscribe to it like daggle and we have also enabled ens for you guys so that uh, like names and authors will be resolved for you and like in the background we'll be using ethers and with an pro like we need an rpc url for that which supports uh, resolving those names yeah a pretty this is daggle and yeah let, now let's check the results for these two which we have submitted earlier So yeah, uh, you can click on check result to get your results. The IPFS nodes hosted on Backlog, like it takes some time. Uh, so instead what we will be doing is that we'll copy the job ID and we will directly get it from the CLI, which is uh, Backlog get and the job ID. 
let me also uh, get the results for the remove bg let me go to my other console the color get yep let me submit that too so yeah you can see that there is a new folder which is being created yeah, d7 here we can see the outputs and the results yeah you can see that hello from hfs final which we have submitted earlier and let's check for this yeah even this thing got published yeah okay let me bring my terminal down you can see that we have a modified image yeah pretty much this is like this is our platform this is daggle for you guys hope you like my presentation and thanks for seeing amazing Thank you so much, Leo. That was uh, it was great. Uh, a really cool demo to be able to actually send all these kind of package jobs to be able to do this in a, in a whole decentralized way, and hopefully you get to add a lot more actions for people to uh, to use. Mm -hmm. so, yep. Congrats. All right. Next up is our demo number five. I want to bring on Mohit to talk about Web three stash. Welcome. Hello. Yeah. So. Hi everyone, this is Mohit and uh, this is my project Web3 Stash, which is a standard library to get a single API to connect to multiple decentralized service providers. So you all might have used uh, decentralized storage networks to store your data and probably you would have used services like IPFS, Pinata, NFT.storage, Web3.storage or Helia client. But the problem that mostly the users face and especially the new users face is that they get confused between all these services They uh, they like take a lot of time to understand how to upload json data how to upload uh, video how to upload image across all these services and uh, the another problem is like the syntax along uh, across these services are quite different so if you have to migrate from one service to another, you have to understand their documentation. They have you have to change your code, which takes a little bit of time for your your development process. To solve all these issues and have a common interface between uh, all of these decentralized storage networks and services, Web3 Stash has been made. So what you have to exactly do is basically you just have to install Web3 Stash library. You don't have to install any other library. If you want to use any of the service providers, you just have to install Web3 Stash. It is uh, it supports common JS and ES6 formats, so you can use it in any Node project. Uh, once you have installed the Web3 Stash library, you just have to instantiate the Web3 Stash constructor and pass the service name. So services like services are like this: IPFS, HTTP, Infura, Pinata. So whatever service you want to use, just put the name here, like Pinata or IPFS, and then provide the config. Config is like uh, the private key or the API key or API secret uh, needed for that service. You can keep the config options null. Uh, if you want to have advanced options, then you can use it. But only these two things are needed to connect to the IPFS through any of these services. And once you have instantiated that, you just have to call these functions, which is same across all the services. So if you want to upload JSON, just call service.uploadJSON and pass the JSON data. If you want to upload image, just put the path and image gets uploaded video and file the best part is another thing is like the output for all of these services i have also kept same across uh, in the npm library so whatever the service you are using you will get the output in this format like the id which is basically the hash you want to store on the smart contracts etc etc and then the metadata associated with it uh, if you want to use it you can use it but the output is same the functions are same and it's just uh, like a single line syntax to use. So you can use like Helia. Helia is just launched, so you can use Helia also. You just you don't have to pass any config as well in Helia. Just pass Helia. Helia is ready. Then call the services. Same way for Pinata. Just instantiate with Web3 Stash Pinata. Pass the API key and API secret, and then you have all these services with. You have like upload from Stream as well. Stream is like for big videos or big images. So you have to do chunk uploading if you are uh, <clears throat> uploading from AWS or any other service. So that is also simplified here. Just provide the readable stream. It will do chunk uploading uh, for the big videos and big images. So let me go quickly to the demo. So this is, uh, I have created a test uh, NPM uh, uh, 
project to test the Web3 Stash library. The Web3 Stash is currently available on NPM, so you can use it right away as well. So I have just instantiated all the services. So you can see just one line for instantiation, Web3 Stash passing in Pura, Pinata, and I have just provided all these things. And once I have done this, so I will just call any of the services. So let's say I want to use the Infura service, the IPFS service. So I will just do npm start and uh, just take 30 seconds to upload the video and I will get the hash. <clears throat> Yeah, so you can see I got the output from the I have console log. So this is like the IPFS hash. So if I just open it, you can see there is metadata and the ID. So if I just uh, go on the gateway to check like whether it's really uploaded. So <clears throat> so yeah, the video is there. So same way, like if you want to use Pinata. These are the things to use for Pinata, like Pinata dot different, different kind of service. You can just pass directly the JSON and you have to just provide the path. Uh, all these things are kept here in my local. So I will just call this thing and this is done. So waiting for its upload and same way for stream upload. So you can see there is a Pinata stream upload. So if you want to do chunk uploading, so this is the way I'm creating a read stream. And then uh, I'm just providing the stream to the upload video from stream stuff. So I will just comment out this thing and uh, I will just call this. So it will upload the video in chunks and uh, probably it's a small video, but if it's a, a big video, you will see the difference of uploading it in the chunks and from the stream. So uh, this is almost all about my project. So if you are like using any of the decentralized storage networks and uh, if you are using any of these services, use Web3 Stash to ease out your development process. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Mohit. Thank you. So there's an echo. Uh, well, this is super cool because uh, I have myself tried to uh, do this a lot of times for large files, and it's just always tricky to figure out the streamable uploads. So uh, now I finally get to use a library for ETH Global. So this is great. Thank you. All right. Next up is demo number six. I want to bring on Naomi to talk about Hardside Hangouts. Welcome. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Naomi. I'm a front end developer. And for the past two weeks, I've been building Hardside Hangouts a mobile app for book clubs. So you might be thinking, well, Web3 and book clubs, what does this have to do? Well, to put it simply, there's a lot of issues you can run into when you're a member of a book club, from you know getting your source materials with you know banned books to organizing or even moderation. And the good thing is that Web3 Tech can help. And that's how I got the idea to build a mobile app that will help readers find their book club, but also have more easier and meaningful conversation, thanks to um, milestone-based reading and dropping audio call. And uh, now that you're all caught up with what hurts I hang out, it is time for a small demo. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do is uh, explore the clubs. So right now I'm not connected, so I cannot see any club. But if I go and check this club details, I can see the current read, who is uh, running the club. And I can also um, see here that they have a couple of discussions. However, I'm not uh, signed in. Therefore, I do not have access to the discussion. And here in the schedule tab, I can see the different milestones. But again, since I'm not signed in, I do not have access to them. So to, to fix this, what we're going to do is we're going to sign up. Here, I'm going to sign up with my Google account. So this um, social uh, sign-in is powered by uh, Magic SDK which allows users to sign in with their um, Google account, Twitter account, any social account. But under the hood, uh, they are actually using a Web3 wallet. So this is going to just take us a couple more seconds. It's going to still take a couple more seconds to appear. And in the meantime, uh, I'm going to just explain that all the data that you see in the app are actually stored on Polybase. And uh, we don't need to sign any messages thanks to the magic SDK. All right, so I'm signed in. Now, if I go back to the clubs, 
I unlocked the My Club tab and I can see all the different clubs that I'm either running or I'm a member of. So if I go to this club, what we're going to do first, we can see here that I can update the details and I can also change the current read. So let's go ahead and do that. So here we're going to have access to a wide range of books thanks to the Google Books API. So we picked a book. Now it's getting indexed to our Polybase database. I'm going to set it as our current read. So all the, I didn't mention it yet, but all the images that you can see in the app are, or other media for that matter are stored uh, thanks to Web3 Storage. All right, so now we have our current read being set. And now that we set a read, I'm going to edit the schedule by adding different milestone, right? We add our title, we set, let's say, today in one hour, and we're going to create our milestone. So our milestone was added properly. And here I can see that um, I can join an audio room for my uh, milestone. So let's go ahead and do that. And here it's going to open a Huddle 01 audio room. All right, we got the room open here. But uh, we can also see here that in the club discussions, um, I have access to this milestone room that I just created. And I can, sorry about this. I can share messages in the club room and any other members will be also allowed to post messages and read them. But if you're not a member of the club, you won't be able to do that. So now if we go back to the schedule tab, we can see here that I have this uh, milestone that I created earlier and I can RSVP. All right, I RSVP. Now, if I go to my calendar, I can see here that it was successfully added to my calendar with the link that I showed earlier. All right, and that's how I hang out in a nutshell. Uh, thank you very much for um, watching this demo, and thank you for ETH Global and all the sponsors for this. Amazing. Thanks so much, Naomi. And this is super cool to see that uh, you kind of built something that you're also super passionate about and also gets more people into Web3. This is great. All right. Um, three more demos to go. So let's bring our third last team, Chitty Chat, to our demo. So Patrick, welcome. Feel free to uh, get started with what you built. Sounds good. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. I'm Patrick from the Chitty Chat team. DAOs are hard to manage, and most of the time, the tools used to communicate like Discord or Telegram are not Web3 optimized. We wanted to create a tool that would make it easy to create a data DAO, manage it, and interact with it, leveraging other Web3 tools natively, all within a chat itself. So we created Chitty Chat. Um, so let's imagine that we are an AI art collective and we want to experiment with AI tools. We want to create the perfect prompt for the art, have an AI system create the art itself, and curate the art that will be stored using Filecoin. Using the push up, we can create an FEM data DAO chat group with participating wallets and execute various commands. So, for example, here I can create an FEM data DAO with a simple click. Just have to create my name, description, nothing too, uh, too interesting here. And then I can add whatever wallets I want within this data DAO. All, every single wallet that, that is integrated into the data DAO has the same voting rights in terms of what they want to do for, um, for voting in terms of creating proposals and saving uh, files. And so in the back end, what happens essentially is just by creating this group chat, uh, this data DAO chat, um, all the different Falcon FVM uh, contracts get deployed. And uh, and all the tokens, the necessary votes, the governance, all, every, all of that gets automatically created for everyone within that chat. Um, so once the data is created, we can communicate within the chat, as I said before. And within the chat, there's there's premium features. So one example is like calling ChatGPT API that can only be accessed using super fluid ApeCoin streams. So right now, in effect, uh, this chat is token-gated using ApeCoin. Um, 
So going back to our example, uh, let's begin by creating a suitable stable diffusion prompt using ChatGPT. So we're asking ChatGPT to create us a prompt to then be able to use that prompt for stable diffusion. So we get a prompt back, which is great. I have saved a prompt already to use this. And what we're going to do is we're going to call Bacalao, um, the Bacalao network, uh, the stable diffusion application on top of the Bacalao network with the specific prompt that we want to create um, to create an image from it. And this is all within the chat. Every single person within the chat can see what's going on. So from this um, from, from this Bacalao job, essentially, we just uh, created, we can fetch uh, the outcome of the job uh, once it's done. And then we'll, this fetching, essentially, we already have done it before. We have a nice little sailboat picture here that was created using the Bacalao network. Um, with this file now, we can push it over to IPFS, create a car file from it, just straight from the chat. And then the most powerful kind of aspect to this application is that now we can propose uh, to save this file uh, just within the chat itself. So by doing by going call to a function call FDM propose within this set of arguments, we can create a proposal within this data DAO within the chat that uh, will store this file. So what's going to happen here is that in the back, um, this this proposal will be sent over to a smart contract. An ID is going to come out of this proposal. And then anyone within this chat can uh, vote for, for the proposal. So you can go and call FDM vote, and you need the right proposal ID for it. We already have a proposal ID that's ready for us to do this. At this point, we're going to have essentially three buttons that are going to come out, a yes, no, and abstain uh, for anyone to be able to vote on this proposal. Again, we're, we're the proposal is to save a stable diffusion image that we just created. I'm going to go ahead and say yes. I like this uh, image. So now we're going to go from the Gorily network, which was the network used before, to the Filecorn network. Switch to that. The a pop up of MetaMask saying that you you want to vote um, yes will come up. I'll be able to confirm. And at that point, and then we go back to the Gorily network, which is the current network for this chat. App. And so right now that has been sent out. The proposal will. Um, as the votes get counted and as a timeline, uh, time of the vote gets uh, gets finished, then at that point we can call FVM execute to execute this vote uh, with the right proposal ID, which then will save the file that we've just created within the chat um, onto the Falcon network. Um, so again, just to go back to what we've done, we successfully created a data DAO with other artists, created a prompt using ChatGPT, used Bacalao to create a stable diffusion image fetched and uploaded this file to IPFS. We proposed using our, DAO, our data DAO to save this file to Filecoin, and we've fully voted and executed the vote all within the same application, making, making it very, very simple um, to be able to manage what's going on with this DAO. Thank you very much, and thank you for listening. Amazing. Thanks, Patrick. This is super cool, and I feel like we're just scratching the surface on what you can do with, with tap prompts and. Uh, integrating with a lot of the, the Web3 protocols and seeing data DAOs used this way is even more amazing because you get to kind of bring in the group chat with all the contributors immediately. So it's just it's gonna be fun. Congrats. Thank you. All right, <clears throat> two more demos to go. So welcome our second last demo for today, which is Team Subprober. Utku, welcome. Mm. Uh, hi everyone, this is Utku from uh, Team Subprober. Uh, uh, we built uh, an all-in-one and no-code decentralized IPC subnet explorer. So uh, you probably know all the keywords. Uh, maybe I can explain what is the IPC subnet is. Uh, IPC is a shorter of interplanetary consensus and subnet is like a subnetwork. Uh, what does this do? Uh, you can launch your own chain inside the Filecoin and uh, you can launch your own chain specifically or for your app for your game or etc. And you can communicate with other subnets. Uh, you can communicate, you can send cross chain messages and you can uh, benefit all the file coin feature by using your subnet. Uh, so why sub proper? Uh, we specifically built for uh, IPC subnets and this indexes everything, uh, including cross chain messages, which is a, a 
uh, IPC subnet uh, feature and of course transactions, accounts and blocks uh, are indexing too. Uh, we have a CLI tool to subnet creators to deploy our uh, infrastructure to decentralized network with no code, which is just one comment. And we are using Tableland and Spheron for decentralized data and decentralized compute. Uh, so I can start my demo by using our CLI tool. Uh, our CLI tool has uh, need three arguments. Uh, first of all is root RPC provider. And second is subnet rpc provider and third one is Feron api key so i'm clicking enter and it's deploying our uh, infrastructure all to the Feron network and uh, this will have some take time and uh, i'm going i'm going to my local node uh, you can see our front end uh, yeah, we have an indexer in the back end uh, it, we utilize filecoin.js to make rpc calls may, way more easier uh, and it creates database based statements and insert into the, into the table land SQL storage, which is a decentralized also. Uh, and we have a server uh, utilize the express.js to serve data from table land to the, our front end. So this is our front end. I built this with uh, React and I integrated Vault Connect to uh, users can show their ANS names, uh, Vault address or avatars or anything. So uh, you can see the last blocks uh, are indexed, uh, last transactions, last cross-chain messages, messages. So right now there is no last cross-chain messages uh, in this uh, node. So you can don't you can see any message. Uh, let's go to the, this uh, block. Uh, it is a block that indexed with a height 54 and this is the block ID and if there's any transaction in this block you can see it right here so right now I'm clicking this transaction and I open the transaction uh, so you can see the transaction ID you can see from address to address uh, value and guest details uh, and if there's any transaction data you can see on here so let's go to the account page uh, I click this from address uh, you can see the address right here, you can see the balance, you can see the nodes, and you can see the all transactions that this address is made. Uh, so let's continue with this slide, uh, I, ex I explained this, uh, and also CLI built with the uh, For For next steps, uh, we need to better database architecture for built-in subnet actors because they perform differently from other uh, databases, uh, so we need uh, better database architecture. And uh, right now we are refreshing our uh, front end to uh, fetch the data, but uh, we need to auto fetch the front end. And maybe uh, we need to add GUI to top of this CLI tool to make improved developer experience. And of course, we need to. Uh, allow users to customize this theme or these colors, uh, anything uh, for subnet creators. Uh, so basically, uh, why we are using Table Land and Spheron, uh, I'm explaining going to that, because uh, the peer-to-peer uh, -peer transactions, the uh, payment platforms using these explorers, and uh, if we can use uh, all decentralized if we can create all decentralized uh, platform, uh, we can eliminate the frauding or misunderstanding by users. Uh, so because the pay payment platforms and peer-to-peer -peer transactions rely on these explorers. So thank you for listening to me. Uh, this is Utku uh, and my partner is or or my college. You can find us on GitHub. Thanks. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for making such a cool utility for others to now kind of leverage subnets even more. And uh, this is great. Hopefully you get to do all the feature features that you just talked about. Congrats. All right. With that, we are ready for our ninth and last finalist demo for today. And without further ado, I'd like to bring on Pablo to talk about DeFi Kicks. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Uh, well, I'm Pablo Maldonado, and today I'm presenting my project, uh, DeFi Kicks. Uh, DeFi Kicks is a data DAO that democratizes DeFi data aggregation. When we talk about DeFi data aggregation, probably the first example that comes to mind is DeFi Llama. DeFi Llama and similar aggregators offer insights like TVL, 
protocol rankings, yield farming, and more, enabling us to evaluate the state of DeFi. The problem with such projects is their lack of true decentralization, as the approval and calculation of information ultimately rely on their team. DeFi Kicks solves this problem by offering a fully decentralized, transparent, and community-governed DeFi data aggregator. At the entry point, the front end allows anyone to propose a new adapter, a JavaScript code piece calculating project TVL at a specific time and continuously generating TVI, TVL over time. Next, any Kik or ApeCoin token holder can vote off-chain on the adapter to approve it or not. The votes are time lock encrypted using unbiased voting. When voting period ends, anyone can execute the resolution, requesting a baccalaureate job through Lilypad to aggregate and decrypt the off-chain votes, calculating the resolution and the rewards, and publishing everything on chain efficiently in a Merkle tree route. Once the adapter is approved, data collection begins through a lead action, ensuring compliance with the adapter code and securely generating and storing the data in a decentralized and trustworthy manner within Ceramic Stream. Finally, the data can be visualized in the dashboard. So I will first start by proposing a new adapter to add my project to DeFi Kids. I will use this sample code that just returns a random number based on the uh, latest uh, block number of the chain. Uh, I will confirm this tra transaction and behind the scenes, uh, I'm first submitting my code to IPFS and then the CID is submitted to the governor contract to start a vote. Now I can go to the voting page and once it loads, uh, we can already see some existing adapters uh, here in different states. Uh, as a voter, I need to evaluate whether an adapter should be added or not to the protocol by checking the code and any other pre-existing rules. I will just go ahead and vote for this one to speed up things and I'm signing this message where I vote for. So during the voting process, as I told before, my vote is time lock encrypted and stored off chain, ensuring a gasless and unbiased vote. And once a vote is approved, anyone can request a resolution uh, to the smart contract. And this resolution triggers a baccalaureate job that computes of chain the resolution together with the rewards, and then finally publish everything uh, on chain. So once uh, an adapter is approved, the data collection is handled by uh, lead actions configured to guarantee compliance with governance votes. And in the end, uh, the data is produced in a decentralized and democratic way. That's it. Thank you for your time and your attention. Thank you so much, Pablo. This is uh, such a nice way to keep a lot of the integrity issues that we face right now in check and super extendable. This can work for anything. So you've got not just a, a, a DeFi Llama equivalent, but you basically got a Datadog. <laughs> so this is super cool. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Those were our nine incredible finalists and i want to thank all of these teams again so wallet otp decentral ai cosmic waves daggle what three stash hard side hangouts shady chat subprober and DeFi kicks these are some incredible projects that kind of showcase some really cool things that came out of hackfs and with that let's move on with all the other things we're going to talk about so if you just joined in you can also head over to ethglobal.com showcase now and see all the projects, all 200 of the projects that came out of this event, including the nine teams that just demoed. There you can see more specifics around what they did and why they did it, how they did things in details, with what protocols and uh, libraries they used along with uh, their source code or for the ones that are live, uh, URL to the project itself for you to play with um, right now. So let's get to all the prizes, which I know a lot of you have been waiting for quite some time. 
Let's get started with the FEM prize. The grand prize goes to FEM Call, DeFi Kicks, and 888. Each of these teams are going to be getting $5,000 each. This is incredible. So congratulations to these three teams for winning the grand prize for the best use of FEM. Then we have the runner-ups for the best integration for FEM. Falcon GPT, Storyteller, Data Nexus, Dow Lingo, Delta, Clover, Career Bro, File Bunnies, and Zenith are going to be receiving $500 each. Congratulations. Then we have ApeCoin. For the best integration of ApeCoin, it goes to FileBlocks for $3,000, and $2,000 goes to Telemedic for the best integration. The best contribution is Vidify for $3,000, and Wallet OTP is the second runner-up for $2,000. Next up is Bacalao. The best use prize goes to all of these teams that are going to be taking in $2,000 each. So Infer AI, Tentai, DeFi Kicks, Daggle, Decentralized Yield Aggregator, and Pensive. All six of these projects are also taking in additional $2,000. Congratulations. Then we have Lip P2P. The best live use of lip p2p goes to these three teams who are going to be taking in 1667 each so lip p2p easy universal connectivity file sharing and star streamer are the three winners for this prize next up is huddle 01 the best use of huddle one goes to SyncX for two thousand dollars and twipe is going to be the runner-up for one thousand dollars congratulations to these two teams on top of that, there were other categories for Huddle as well. So the best React Native use case integration goes to Heartside Hangouts for $1,000. And the most creative use case goes to Telematic, Digital Ticket Stream, Space, Spaces 3, DAP Classroom, and Wiz, Wise, uh, who are going to be getting $500 each. Congratulations. Then we have Saturn. So the best use of Saturn Network goes to Data Trusted Graph Plus, Saturn Moonlet, and Wallet OTP. And each of these teams are going to be taking in 1,667 US dollars. Congratulations. Next up is Push Protocol. So three amazing projects are going to be taking in a lot of cash. The most innovative use of Push goes to Chitty Chat for $1,500. The best use of Push Video or Push Chat goes to Project Flight for $750. And the best all-around integration for Push Chat is Mintlock, who's also going to be receiving $750. And on top of that, these 20 teams are going to be receiving $100 each. So congratulations to everybody listed here. You are the pool prize recipient, and $2,000 is being split equally 20 ways. Then we have Consensus Lab. So the best use of IPC subnet goes to Subprober, and they're going to be taking in $5,000 for the best integration. So congratulations to Subprober. Then we have the IPFS file coin categories. Um, so the best use of any IPFS implementation is going to be given to three or uh, four teams who are going to be spending $5,000 equally. So StarStreamer, Web3Stash, Unit.Store, and FileBlocks are all taking in $1,250 each. So congratulations for the best integration for IPFS. Then we have ENS. Patter is going to be the recipient for the ENS prize for the best integration and use of ENS in their project. Congratulations. And then the 17 teams listed here are also getting the pool prize, which means that these 17 teams will be splitting the total amount and each team will end up with $235 each delivered to them. So congratulations to all 17 teams. Then we have a lit protocol. So the best use of lit action and PKPs goes to DeFi Kicks and ARC, who are going to be taking in $2,000 each. And wildcard category winner is Wallet OTP. And Wallet OTP will be taking in another $1,000 for the best integration to lit. Next up is Dataverse OS. So the best use of Dataverse OS prize goes to Pensive for $2,500. Congratulations for building something with the Sovereign Data Operating System. Then we have Spheron. Wasla is the recipient for the best use of Spheron for $2,500. Congratulations. 
Then we have Polybase. So the best use of Polybase goes to these three projects for first, second, and third. Wallet OTP is a $2,500 first place recipient. Card Protocol is the second place $1,500 recipient. And Botswald is the runner up for $1,000 prize. Then we have LivePeer. The best use of LivePeer goes to Archiver for $2,000. Safe Upload is the $1,500 recipient. And Telematic, Demo Vault, and Bid My Video are going to be receiving $500 each for being three runner ups for the best integration for LivePeer. Then we have Ceramic. The best use of Ceramic goes to Wise for $2,500. AI.repo is the second place $1,500 winner, and Decentral AI is going to be taking in third place for $1,000. Then we have Tableland. The best use of Tableland goes to Subprober for $1,500. DData Calabria is the second place winner for $1,000, and Ethereum account fraud detection will be taking in the third place runner-up for $500 price. So congratulations to all three of these teams. And on top of that, so many amazing teams worked on use Tableland. So these 12 teams are also going to be splitting the pool prize, which means everybody here will be getting $167 each. So congrats to all these teams here. Then we have Filecoin Data Tools. So the best use of Filecoin Data Tools goes to Data Gent DAO and E2A, who are going to be receiving $2,500 each. Congratulations to both of these teams. Next up is NFT Storage. So the best use of Web3.Storage or NFT.Storage goes to these five projects for $500 each. So congratulations to Fitweave, Archiver, Heartside Hangouts, Card Protocol, and Jemmy Lab. And all of your projects are going to be receiving $500 each. Next up is Lighthouse. So the best use of Lighthouse goes to D Data Calabria for $2,500. So congratulations for using permanent file storage protocol and not having to worry about your deals. Amazing. Then we have DRAN for the best use of a randomness beacon. So the best use of randomness goes to these three teams. We're going to be taking in $667 each. So congratulations, DeFi Kicks, Chamber of Secrets, and Democracy. So amazing. Then we have Barracks. So the best use of Barracks API goes to Datagent, DAO, Wasla, Pensive, Phil Friends, and DStore, who are going to be taking in $300 each. Congratulations. Those are all of our winners. And you can check all these things out now on ethglobal.com slash showcase, which means that if you want a prize, it should in a minute reflect on your profile and you will be able to see what prize you won on directly your showcase profile. If you're logged into your hacker dashboard, you'll also see what prizes you've won and uh, immediately be able to celebrate all the amazing things that you've achieved. On top of all of that, uh, don't worry if you're not watching this video live, you can also see this thing. We'll be notifying every team uh, via email about all the prizes you've won and confirming everything before we move forward. So a quick note on prize delivery is as follows. We are announcing all the prizes as things that are tentative because we've only had 48 hours to go through all these things with our partners. And we are going to be doing a lot more diligence before we release the prizes, which means that all of them will be released on the 21st of July. And that gives us the next couple of weeks to go through everything, make sure that everybody's source code was correct. We may want to make sure nobody cheated. We want to make sure that nobody worked on their projects before. And that's only then we will lock in all the actual winners. So that also means that everything that you heard so far is tentative and not final, which means that if some team is disqualified, we will find a way to replace them uh, with the help of our partners to pick another winner, or if somebody was part of the pool prize category and they're removed or somebody's added, then the average amounts that you receive for a pool prize will also change accordingly. So keep that in mind, um, and uh, that's just a notice. And uh, the other thing is all the prizes that are not delivered by the protocol labs, which is the IPFS and Falcon prize, will be delivered by 8th Global. but IPFS and Falcon prizes specifically will be delivered by Protocol Labs. So you'll be getting two emails 
from both of the, the the organizations telling you what the next steps are and if global will not be delivering the ipfs and the falcon specific prices so you'll be hearing separately with a separate process to uh, get the next steps so you'll get that email very soon as well and shortly after everything is finalized and everything is reviewed we'll be releasing all the prizes to all of you directly now i also want to make sure we talk about what comes next we talked about all the prizes we saw some nine amazing finalists and the goal here is to talk about and really make sure we highlight how do you actually continue to keep on building uh, hackathons are meant to be a quick way for you to help prototype something, validate an idea, or even see if a proof of concept is something that goes really well. And we want to do something uh, to make sure that you will have the support here. So there's a lot of support, especially in this ecosystem, to get the next help and steps uh, going for your project. There's a lot of accelerators that are available. We'll talk about how uh, you can kind of get all, all these things. Uh, there's a lot of other hackathons that we're hosting in person and online that you can join globally and sort of get to learn more about this ecosystem. You can also join the PL Launchpad to get directly the, the right support you need to actually fast track and, and launch your project and make this more than just a hackathon project. And also if you are coming to Paris in a few weeks to either attend ETCC or ETH Global Paris, there's also a lot of other events going on from the protocolized ecosystem, especially Phil Paris, where you can actually come and learn about everybody else in this community and showcase and get the right, right help. So these are just the four quick things that you can do as immediately next if you want to build your project more. But I also want to take on a second to kind of actually introduce somebody special here, uh, Juan Bonet, to, uh, to kind of take a few minutes and share what is it that you can do here from from your end to actually turn this project into a startup. Um, this is something that we've done in the past and it's an amazing talk that I'd love for him to kind of talk about again. So without further ado, let's welcome Juan to actually tell us about what it means to take something from an idea to something that all of us can use every day. Juan, welcome. Hey, thank you so much uh, and super honored to be here. Uh, really, it, it's been awesome to uh, follow along with uh, everything happening around across uh, Hackfest. Uh, uh, it's great to be in this in this final moment. Um, I just want to talk briefly about uh, what it takes to start a startup in this uh, broader ecosystem and some of the you know kind of a, a quick overview of like the different kinds of resources available to you that you know you'll hear in more detail um, uh, about later. Uh, and so I'm gonna share my screen briefly. Uh, let me know if you can see that one second. Uh, can you see that? There we go. Awesome. So uh, it, it's it's really exciting to see, uh, and this might be an added screenshot, so there might be uh, uh, there might be some changes here. But it's it's really awesome to see so many um, startups that uh, actually started in uh, through either HackFest or other ETH Global um, hackathons not coming back to uh, actually sponsor prizes and uh, with really strong dev tools and so on. Um, there might be other, a, a whole range of other uh, groups that you've gotten to know over over the month um but it's, it's really a testament to uh the entire flow of how hackers get used to new technologies um build new products get new ideas and then some of those end up turning into um really successful uh projects and really successful startups um so uh i wanted to kind of go through the different stages that it that kind of startups uh are, are kind of grow from, and not all sort of paths are, are look like this. Um, startups in general are tend to be these uh, kinds of entities and organizations that are um, uh, unconventional. They tend to push uh, different, they push their own paths. That, uh, no, no two startups are exactly the same, uh, but there tends to be some kind of common similarities across many of them, and some trajectories that that um, that have worked well for for a lot of teams. And so uh, that's kind of what I what I want to talk about today. So you know the the kind of startup journey starts initially with the kind of the founding team uh, learning a ton about the world, and so you, this could be through through uh, uh, school, through jobs, through kind of reading online, um, through participating in uh, in different kinds of programs. So, so there's an enormous amount of learning that goes um, into uh, the, the building the skill sets and and learning rate um, and, and knowledge knowledge gathering and acquisition skills and um, uh, just kind of everything that, that makes you you um 
and puts you in the right position to be able to notice problems and be able to have the skill sets required to uh, to build something. So the good news here is like all of you have been preparing for this for like your, your whole life since you were uh, babies and you were just growing. Uh, you were already kind of learning an enormous amount about the world to to be able to kind of uh, solve problems. Um, now, kind of the the what I think is like a, a really important first big step that a lot of um, uh, groups take is to then start experimenting with ideas. Um, and that that experimentation is partly thinking about some problem space, partly thinking about potential products that could be uh, built around the, uh, solving that problem, part understanding the problem in depth, like really figuring out why the problem exists, why it hasn't been solved already, why other groups um, haven't, haven't uh, solved them yet, um, and so on. And a huge key component of that experimentation is actually trying to build products end to end. And this is where hackathons uh, offer an a, a really tremendous opportunity for, for everybody to uh, keep refining that. And um, it's not every, uh, it's not just kind of one hackathon. You can think of this as uh, using multiple hackathons over time to keep having multiple experimentation shots uh, to be able to try build, try understanding some problem space, try building a solution, try building a product uh, fully end to end um, to then kind of see whether it has uh, potential, see whether it has legs, see whether you want to take it on. Uh, in, in kind of a, in, a, in a bigger way. Um, and so I really see kind of the the uh, hackathon stage is kind of a really important experimentation loop, um, whether it's kind of the current project that you just built that you feel super excited about taking on and turning into a startup, uh, or whether it's um, a future project that you do through a hackathon. Um, hackathons give you this really, really great um, experimental loop where you, know, you, you really have to come up with a, a product ideas, design the whole thing end to end. Um, the deadline of the hackathon itself forces you to kind of Pull, it to, uh, pull the whole thing together in, in, in kind of a short time frame. Uh, it gives you enough time to go in depth into one um, range of uh, uh, some parts of the product and, and actually solve some hard problems uh, there, you know, kind of, um, and, and also even short hackathons, like a weekend hackathon, uh, you can get like the, the, you can really test an idea um, e even in kind of a, a very short, uh, short hackathon where you um, are just kind of plugging a lot of pieces together or kind of seeing if, if, if some concept uh, would work. Um, my favorite, uh, I, I think, are like the three to four week um, hackathons because I think those give teams enough time and space to actually solve like hard problems and and and, so, and get the whole product um, kind of built end to end, fully working and, and so on. So like that, that and, and having the, the um, uh, requirement of, of showcasing and demoing and presenting the hack um, also stress, uh, uh, trains a lot of your skills in terms of being able to articulate what this thing is, uh, telling other people about, um, about it, uh, describing the problem that you're solving, describing the solution space that you're exploring. Um, and so it really kind of uh, forces you to, to understand the problem well enough and, and how to sell the product and how to sell the idea. Um, and then what comes sort of comes after that is that a lot of people as they in, in encounter your idea and encounter your, um, uh, uh, your, your demo and so on will then start flowing feedback back to you. Uh, some people will try it, some people will um, like it, some people won't. Um, you know, new products, you know, primarily just get you know tons of negative feedback because you know new products tend to be very, very early and very rough and so on. So uh, it, that's totally fine, totally good, and like um, that's kind of how new products are are, are born. Um, but that feedback is, is crucial and essential in giving you kind of a um, more understanding about the problem, more understanding about the clients, and 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 what they would want out of out of that product. And so. Really, hackathons are this great moment to be able to kind of experiment with all of this. Now, sort of like what comes after that is that you, as you, whether it's kind of again this project that you have uh, with you now, or a project in the, in the future that you um, uh, build in a future hackathon, or or even kind of on your own, um, you can then start connecting that to um, uh, other uh, uh, either programs or 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 if the product is ready enough, you can like launch it and see if um, people start using it and so on. Um, and so, so there's a whole set of resources and tools kind of after the kind of very early phase of building a product that, that can be useful. Uh, and you kind of jump into this moment of, of kind of early validation of whether or not this idea has strong, uh, strong potential. And so this phase is really about kind of uh, you, you have a, an idea formed up about a potential problem space. You have an idea formed up about what the potential solution would be. You have a, um, a, a working component or, or a working demo or, or even a working product sometimes. Um, and you're kind of validating whether or not that product is going to work uh, in the market and it's going to work with a set of clients and a set of users and, and so on. And, and I sort of like try to describe this space as kind of having like a minimum product. It's not yet viable. You're, still, you're kind of figuring out what are the, the details about it that could make it viable. Um, and in this period, it, it's, it, um, it's a lot about kind of 
positioning of the product, really figuring out what are the key features that will really matter to the to the end users. What what must exist in this um, for this product to be successful? And and so it's a lot about learning. So so you're you're trying to build things and trying to put them in front of people and trying to to get insights from them to inform what what will produce an actual viable product. Um, and many times, a lot of the projects here kind of actually find out that like, hey, this idea won't be viable. Uh, and, and that's fine. Like you know, most most startups. Um, uh, or, or most projects don't don't make it into a, into a big a big thing. Um, it's good to kind of e even that learning is a really useful thing that lets you kind of um, move on to to the next idea or something like that. Uh, but this kind of early validation phase is really key that helps you um, figure out whether the project is is going to work in the, in the long term or um, how it must be shaped in order to work. Right. So you, you might get a bunch of insights and learnings there that that tune the kinds of things that are that are. Um, the product has to have in order to be successful. So that kind of feedback cycle, um, gather, gathering feedback from, from users, analyzing the feedback, acting on those insights, um, refining the product over time and so on is, is really key. And in this phase, I would strongly encourage you to like, just take an enormous amount of shortcuts. Just you're, you're trying to get the, the, the shape of the product right to be successful. And you're trying to get information about what is gonna make it viable. You're not trying to build a full solution that works for everything. Kind of like the common mistake that I tend to see a lot of teams and a lot of startups make is that um, the thing that kind of building the first version of the product requires building in full and in detail, like every single possible thing that um, that that uh, that product will, will require in the long term. And in reality, you can start uh, a very different way, which is kind of, you, you get enough of it working uh, just to show like the very core um, functionality, like the very core value proposition to to the end user, and focus on that and kind of driving that as a as a uh, product and seeing if that is going to work in the market. And so this this is this kind of approach can point to you like what what is what is um, a potential viable product. And in this um, area, uh, here's where kind of grants become extremely useful. So uh, kind of before that, when you're learning, um, you either are in school or you have uh, some other job or or you're uh, on your own and you're not yet funded through hackathons, you're, you start potentially having the, the opportunity to start winning some prizes to help fund your team. Uh, and this kind of early validation period, you now, especially if you're going to be working on this um, uh, full time, then you start needing um, some way of sustaining the project and sustaining the, the, the product and so on. Sometimes this might be too early for accelerators. Sometimes uh, accelerators are really good for this uh, this moment. Uh, this is where I think like micro grants can, are extremely useful. There's a number of programs that, that do these kinds of prizes and these kinds of grants. Um, that can be extremely helpful for teams here that kind of want to want to get some early validation and figure out whether that uh, product is going to work out. Kind of the next step uh, after that is, is once you kind of have a sense of what will actually make a, a minimum viable product, even if you haven't fully been able to build it yet or deliver it, uh, you have a lot more insight into what will um, be a viable product. Th that that I think is like the, the right moment to fully kind of like start the startup, uh, uh, so to speak. And this is where accelerated programs are extremely useful. They can help guide you um, in terms of um, how how to work, how to start a startup in the first place. Like, what does that mean in terms of incorporating entities? What does that mean in terms of um, actually being able to kind of um, uh, employ people? What does that mean in terms of getting, raising funding and, and so on? So this is kind of like where you go from, hey, you have an idea for a minimum viable product to a building that minimum viable product and testing it out in the market and, and starting to get uh, strong users and B, creating the organism, the structure, the entity and so on that is going to be able to build that product over time. That's going to make it sustainable. And so that entity is, um, you know, in many times, this could be a company, this could be a foundation, this could be um, a, a crypto network. It could be, it, there, there are many different kinds of, um, this could also be an open source project. Uh, sometimes it, it doesn't follow the, 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 the path of a, of a company or something like that. Um, the, the, the point though is that you need some kind of organizational structure to, to organize the people that are going to be working on on producing this this minimum viable product, uh, and there's a ton of accelerators in in in, in the network that, that are um, that are there uh, uh, for you uh, to be able to get, apply to and 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 work with and and so on uh, that could be could be helpful. Uh, and then kind of after the accelerator programs, once you uh, are working on that minimum viable product, once you've kind of uh, validated it with actual users and actual customers and so on, you're starting to get like traction on that MVP, and you're starting to get cycles of users. And in that area is when you kind of start going from an early potential product into now a product that's starting to get users and starting to get clients and um, is becoming um, a, a thing that people can depend on. Um, you, you go from kind of um, having an MVP, like the minimum viable product into starting to get product market fit, which is kind of the key thing that you need for, for kind of scaling, scaling the use of a product. Product market fit is, is 
when a product um, has the required features and uh, price points and distribution and so on to be kind of understood by the broader market, such that the broader market starts selecting that product and using it at larger scale. And so that, that kind of transition point is, goes from, hey, you have an idea that you're kind of testing out and trying to tell the world to once you start achieving product market fit and, and the world starts finding out about your product and, and if the product fits the requirements of the market, um, then you get this transition that happens when suddenly the growth accelerates and, and you get kind of like this, this big scale up. And it tends to be that product market fit isn't like a binary thing where like whether you don't have it or, or you have it, it's more of a spectrum or a continuum. And it really applies to the shape of the product at the time. Um, and so you can think of a, a very large long-term product as being built in a series of like successively larger versions of the product. Um, you know, one example here is like you can think of social networks where you know many social networks started by um, first creating a very lightweight social network tuned for a specific market. You know, kind of famously, this might be like um, Facebook starting with with um, with universities or something like that, or or um, uh, a a messenger app that like starts with just one on one DMs, uh, and then over time, you know, once you get kind of like that MVP working well enough and you get some early product market fit and you get a number of users, then you start kind of expanding the product into kind of like the next MVP of like a different size where you suddenly start adding, um, you know, another range of features or, or you sort of start scaling, scaling what that product means. And each of those kind of sequential um, ranges of the product or the sequential levels of the product has its own notion of product market fit of whether or not like the feature set is, is, is the right fit for, for the market and so on. And in this point in time is kind of where you potentially start getting Early, um, early indication of whether or not the business model is going to work. Um, so uh, there, are, there are some kinds of startups that defer the monetization until like much later, and those tend to create like warp business models in some cases. This is kind of where a lot of the social networks, in my view, kind of went wrong, where they sort of turn into into primarily advertising-driven businesses. Uh, if you can kind of figure out the sustainability path for a product very early on, you can figure out a good monetization path that um, aligns the incentives of the users with the product builders and the participants, and so on. And makes it a very good, sustainable um, uh, kind of uh, regenerative structure. Like that, that that can be a, a much, much better way. So in this period, when you know in the accelerated stages and, and early traction, as as you're kind of starting to raise raise funding, or um, this is going to be a great moment to then really figure out what the what the business model should be, um, how to uh, structure monetization, how to how to make the whole product sustainable. Because at the end of the day, a product requires um, a whole range of uh, people building that product, uh, refining it over time, improving it over time, and all of that costs significant amount of uh, amount of money and resources. So, creating a structure that is sustainable that has a strong revenue flow is is critical to to making sure that products serve their customers really well uh, and are able to scale. So, you kind of want to figure out that out and, and sort of get it right. You might have inklings of what of what the right business model is very early on, but you should be ready to kind of experiment with that along the way, change it. Um, to kind of really figure out what makes sense in the market. Sometimes innovations are about figuring out the right business model to support a product uh, the right way. And, and there are many products out there that haven't quite actually figured out like the right way to create a, a bis business that's well aligned with, with their users. Um, in this period, kind of like after accelerators, this is kind of like the pre-seed sort of range. This used to be called seed many, many years ago, but you kind of get this behavior where like seed and series A and series B and like all of those terms about uh, fundraising rounds just kind of keep increasing in scale and people tend to invent like new words that come before. So, you know, back in the day, seed funding might've been like, you know, a thousand dollars or something like that. These days, like that, that's, you know, pre-seed is kind of like, you know, sub a million dollars or, or, or something like that. And then seed starts looking into, into millions. And this area is great for say angel investors um, and early, you know, uh, small VC funds and so on. You're not quite yet ready for like the larger scale, larger scale VC that kind of, kind of comes in the, in the later stage. Once you have a, a a sense of strong product market fit and a strong business model, and you have a lot of indications of like this is going to be a like, highly scalable thing. Um, then some startups pursue the path of like they, they, they're good for VC um, in terms of like the potential return multiples and the and the and the scale of the business and and so on. Um, and then at that point, kind of uh, is is the right time to kind of think about um, whether or not this is this should be a VC funded um, effort effort or not. And, and so this is kind of like the, the pathway. There's, of course, many more stages that come after that. Like seed is kind of, it, many people regard seed as just like the beginning of the, of the journey. There's, you know, many more years and many more work um, ahead after this. Uh, but this is, I, I kind of like giving an inside view here because for you at this stage or kind of where you are, these are the stages that sort of will matter uh, to you over the next few months uh, or, or over the next year or two. 
um, and the and these are the the ones that are that, that will be will be useful to you. Uh, kind of later on, uh, once the company starts growing, then you know there's many more stages there, and you can think of those as kind of the traditional, um, you know, seed series A, series B, and so on, where there are different kind of um, uh, gates in terms of the scale of the business, the the um, the strength of the the product, the strength of the revenue, and and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so across all of these stages, there are many different kinds of resources uh, that can be helpful to you, many different scales of funding. Um, we've tried uh, through the PL network to create, um, so, uh, to work with a lot of partners and create solutions for people going across these stages. Um, and so, you know, things from grants at the right times, accelerator programs, uh, investor network, and so on. You'll hear about uh, more in detail later on, but I'll just, I'll just flash out um, a couple uh, in a kind of like a high level, high level way. Uh, you can think of the PL network being an a, a kind of network of organizations that is trying to help a lot of startup builders start their startups, uh, access capital, um, find talent to help staff their projects, um, get access to knowledge and get access to services that can help uh, them grow. Uh, I started PL to create this kind of easier and faster and better way to to uh, do stronger R and D, especially in like deep technical domains that are that tend to be underfunded by uh, by traditional VC and uh, and so it can be helpful, like definitely, uh, you know, reach out and use the, the resources of the network. Um, everything from kind of uh, uh, micro grants, um, the accelerator programs that have been like, you know, tremendously successful for so many teams, um, the broader investor network, you know, there's many thousands of investors in, in, in the broader PL network. Um, and even things like PLVC, which are kind of a program that, that help connect startups that are um, starting their fundraising rounds to a, a whole range of investors. So to try and accelerate the, the fundraising uh, period. And, and then, of course, um, many kind of uh, service providers for many kinds of uh, uh, problem spaces. So things like legal services, people services, accounting, finance, and so on. And, and these are, of course, like will be useful like once you get, you know, post the seed stage and so on, you start sort of growing. Uh, but so that's more tuned for, for those groups. Uh, but that's it. Uh, thank you uh, so much for the time. Uh, really excited about uh, everything that everybody has been working on. Uh, really excited for, for the um, this latest version of HackFS. HackFS is super near and dear. Uh, to my heart uh, is the first uh, hackathon that we started working on um, with ETH Global. Uh, it's been so awesome to see the um, success over time uh, in, the, in the last few years of the program. Uh, it, it's been so inspiring to me personally to see so many people come through um, HackFS and get to start learning about um, these systems, trying out a, bun a bunch of ideas. Sometimes those projects themselves from HackFS turn into startups themselves and grew. And now we're back here uh, sponsoring HackFS. Um, in other cases, those teams went on to build other projects through other hackathons and, and got started a different different way. So it's just really awesome to to be part of this. And thank you so much. Uh, back to you, Kartik. Been an incredible last four years. So thanks for uh, kind of giving us that overview and uh, can't wait for the next four. This is amazing. Thanks, Juan. Thank you. Bye. All right, so before we finish this whole event and close HackFS 2023, I wanna start off by saying a few thank yous and really make the people who made all this possible in the background kind of get that spotlight because without them, this would not be fully possible. That of course is everybody behind the scenes, judges, mentors, volunteers, the speaker, our partners, but most importantly, all of you as hackers, you kind of spent the last three weeks with us and that means a lot to us doing something that you are excited about and doing that for such a long time to really get something from an idea to a working product at the end. It's uh, it's an incredible thing and you should be absolutely proud of it. I want to thank all of you for building something that keeps you even more excited about what you can do as a developer. I also want to thank all of our judges who took the time and hours of their day to talk to every single team that demoed and give them feedback, learn more about what they built, the challenges that they ran into and what they're excited about to do next. So thank you so much to our judges. Also for all of our amazing speakers who did workshops, our summit talks, panels, and all the things that you could do to quickly catch up on everything that is happening in the world of Web3 and Protocol Network, Protocol Labs Network. And there's a lot of other mentors and volunteers that were doing so much behind the scenes, making sure that you had the right support from all of our, our partners, all of our protocols that are giving out prizes to just dedicated mentors that were just there 24 seven to answer any question that you had. So thank you to all of these amazing mentors and volunteers. And of course, all of our partners, everybody that's been part of all the teams from those 29 partners that are part of this event, 
thank you so much for taking the time to be with us for the last few weeks. And last but not the least, I want to give a special shout out to the rest of the 8th Global team. All of these members here, Shari, Andrew, Chen, Maggie, Nunu, Oigan, Taylor, Fred, Polly, Rory, Chloe, Kevin, Richie, Minnie, Anna, Moaz, Emily, Andrew, and Jacob. They've been working so hard behind the scenes to make sure you have the best experience, no matter what type of event it is and no matter when the event is, to really ensure that everybody here comes off with a successful outcome. And uh, without the team here, they would not be possible. So those were some of our thank yous. You saw all the winners. But uh, one thing that we didn't do is tell you why somebody is called a finalist. If this is your first ETH Global event, this may be news to you, but these events are not designed to be competitions. We call everybody a finalist because effectively everybody here came in first. There is no next step or first, second, third. Everybody effectively is first place. So all those nine teams are our winners for this hackathon. And as part of being a finalist, in addition to any prize they've received from any of our partners, ETH Global will be giving 500 USDC per team member to all the teams that came in and presented their live demos. So congratulations to all these finalists for winning this prize. But that's just not the only thing. There's a lot more that we're doing. In top of, on top of this, every team member will be getting 10 Sepolia ETH to play with anything they want to do on Sepolia Testnet. We know that Testnet ETH is usually rare these days. We want to make sure that you're not testing on production. Sometimes it's not the best idea. On top of all of that, every team member will also be getting an ENS domain name for their choice to register, and we'll be kind of purchasing it for you for the first year. If you are coming to any of our in-person events, you have free entry to Pragma for any 2023 Pragma that we do. There's three more remaining, one in New York, one in Paris, and one in Istanbul. And if you are interested in getting a hardware wallet, you can get $100 off Grip Plus Lattice and purchase this for your own needs. If you not, are not already on the Lens Protocol Network, you will be able to get listed on the early access program and get your username reserved right now. And on top of all of that, you are also be receiving per member a flight reimbursement to one of our in-person events, whether it's in Waterloo in two days, Paris in July, New York in September, or Istanbul in November. You can claim a $500 flight reimbursement for one of these events to come and hack and pick anything that works best with your schedule or where you are in the world. So congratulations to all these amazing teams for winning not just all the amazing prizes from our partners, but for being our finalists and receiving all these perks. And last but not least, I want to close this off by telling you about what's next. So this wouldn't be an ETH Global event if we don't tell you what's upcoming. Next up is our in-person event in Waterloo, Ontario, Canada, which is this upcoming Friday in just 48 hours. So if some of you are participating. I'm super excited to meet all of you in person in this Friday. Then we're going to be doing ETH Global Paris in July from 21st to 23rd. That's right after ETH CC. A lot of you are going to be there for a lot of other events, and we wish to see a thousand of you here in person for our next in-person hackathon. Then we're going to be going to New York September 22nd with ETH Global New York. And then the next and the last in-person event for the year is going to be Istanbul on November 17th to 19th. That is just at the end of DevConnect by the Ethereum Foundation. So that's kind of the upcoming events. You can check out all these things on ethglobal.com slash events. There's a handful of other ones we haven't talked about in this slide, but there's a 10 more coming and all of these things are live. You can check out the website. You can apply and sign up for any of these immediately. And I wish to see a lot of you again in person and also for the next online events. So with that, I want to thank everybody here for taking the time to be part of HackerFest for the fourth one the last few weeks. And in the meantime, look out for an email from us telling you about what's next for how you claim your prizes. And until then, I want to wish all of you goodbye and happy hacking for the next events. And we'll see you all soon on ETH Global. Thank you so much. Enjoy some lo-fi beats in the meantime. Take care, everybody.